Hello, I'm Jan Leifman. I'm Gayatri from Elmenen. Welcome. Welcome to Med News Week Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine's Global Leaders today. Today, we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. Sanjay Reddy. Dr. Reddy is the co-director of the Greenberg Pancreatic Cancer Institute at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. In today's presentation, Dr. Reddy discusses the latest in pancreatic cancer therapeutics. Did you know that Dr. Reddy is an internationally renowned surgeon in the area of pancreatic cancers? who's also a global leader and clinical trialist in all phases of therapeutic development for pancreatic cancers. He has been recognized amongst Pennsylvania's top 40 physicians under 40 award. He is truly an inspirational leader in the field of oncology. So let's tune in. Let's tune in and learn from this great keynote speaker. So the first part of the talk is somewhat somber. Um, you'll see here a uh, number of new cases and deaths per 100,000, 12 in men, 10.9 um, in women. Lifetime risk of developing this disease is 1.6% will be diagnosed during their lifetime. In 2015 alone, in the United States, almost 70,000 people um, were ailed with this disease. When you look at the numbers of all new cancer cases in 2018, 3.2%. It's not a trivial number. And then all of, of all cancer deaths, almost 7%. So again, when you look at the curves, and this is from SEER data, you see that the new cases are on the incline. Deaths have been sort of stable throughout the years. And the reason the new cases are on the incline is that people are being much more sort of cognizant of this disease, whether it be from um, you know, famous people developing the disease um, and it, you know, being out there more in the mainstream media but it definitely has, has captured a lot of the attention of the general public. When you look at the numbers still, uh, and again, this number is a little bit dated now, but when I started my practice 10 years ago, it was 5%, 8.5%. We are finally moving this needle to a double digit number for, for, for survival. Um, and again, it's those small needle moves and increments in that needle that are, are making a big difference. And the challenge really ends up being is that the majority of these patients present, as you see here, with distant disease, right? 52% will present with metastatic disease, whereas um, regional and localized disease is usually where I can sort of intervene um, is far less. And you can see the five-year survival is directly related to when patients present. So those with regional or localized disease, the five-year survivals are better, obviously, than those with distant disease. When you look at the common types of cancer, breast, lung, prostate, colorectal, pancreatic cancer is number 11. And again, this is rapidly moving up the list of, 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 of cancers that we're paying more mind and attention to. You know, this disease doesn't discriminate against age. Um, I've done Whipple's on, and pancreatectomies on patients as young as 30 um, to as old as 80. And the median age uh, can be anywhere, you know, in the 70s range, but again, the spectrum of, of, of people that are, that are affected by this disease is, um, is wide. And again, this is probably the most important slide of my facts where you can actually see the five-year survival is moving up. And the reason is not because of any advances in surgical techniques, dare I say. I think it's really the fact that we're utilizing a lot of therapies to treat the disease, chemotherapy, radiation, and the combination of all these therapies to help combat this disease. So a little bit of anatomy. I think one of the most important parts of understanding the pancreas is the anatomy is quite difficult oftentimes to um, understand. And again, I think there's a lot of students out there and uh, medical providers in, in some capacity that may not be in surgery. I think understanding the anatomy will, will, will clear the air as to sort of why we do things and what we do. So this is just a basic picture, right, of the pancreas. And you can see here, this is the pancreatic head. This lies within the, the, the loop of the duodenum. And you have the uncinated process, which is the comma part of the, the pancreas. And you can see on the slide where the second arrow is down here, the location of tumors in this location can oftentimes be very close to the veins and the arteries over here, which can sometimes make surgery challenging. Then you have the pancreatic neck, which is over here. And you can, again, appreciate that when you have tumors in the neck of the gland, how close it is to the interface of this vein. So we're talking about a space that's really, really, really confined. Then you have the pancreatic body. 
And then lastly, the pancreatic tail. So each section of the gland is almost like a, a complete different operation. As you move here, this is a great picture to just sort of see how the vessels are intimately involved with this gland. So again, you can see the portal vein just lies right behind here. And when you have tumors that are in these locations, you can see how challenging um, surgery can be because of invasion into these vessels. And again, over here, the celiac trunk over here, and you can see when we have body tumors, this uh, vessel is oftentimes um, at risk. This is just a, a brief video where you can kind of see here um, some anatomy. So this is your common hepatic artery over here. This is your GDA. This is your bile duct. And this is why anatomy is so important. Right behind this bile duct here, over here, is a replaced right hepatic artery. So again, every case is so different and understanding the anatomy prior to diving in is so important um, because these critical structures are oftentimes at risk. Um, and if it's not known beforehand what's going on, it could be dangerous. Um, and then the next sort of, oh, sorry, let me see. Next video here, you see we've divided the bile duct over here and you can see the replaced right hepatic vessel running over here. So again, critical to understand the anatomy in these, in these types of cases. This is probably one of the most sort of textbook pictures that you'll see where we've tunneled underneath the gland of the pancreas. Now everything to the uh, left of your, or the, super, the top part of your screen is coming out. Everything to the bottom part of your screen is staying in. And this is that, you know, that magic tunnel that we do where the portal vein is directly beneath <laughs> which allows then for the tumor to come out. Again, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. This is the lip from the transverse colon up, following the veins down. The wonderful thing about surgery is that by and large, more often than not, the anatomy is the same every single time until it's not. So understanding that really gives you the, the superior edge to um, try to get these tumors out. Here you can see we've now divided the gland and right in the middle is a portal vein. You know, this is a, a, an interesting clip because what you see to the top part of your screen over here, this is oftentimes where vessel invasion will occur and where tumors will be involving this vein, which can make a surgery a little bit more challenging. This sort of nicely leads me to my next sort of uh, focus is definition of resectability. How do you define this disease, right? And you have tumors that are resectable, which means that they're removable. Then you have what we call borderline resectable disease. And this is where I've, I've committed a lot of my research in, where the tumors are kind of up against and kissing the veins and the arteries. And then you have locally advanced disease where tumors are sort of wrapped around those vessels. So why is resectability so important? Well, I'll tell you. By and large, 20 to 25% of patients will present with resectable cancers. So the vast majority of patients presenting with tumors that are abutting, involving the veins, et cetera. And what we know is that if you have a margin positive resection, that's called an R1 or an R2 resection, you do poorly. So the goal is, is how do you maximize an R0 or complete composite resection? This is why defining the resectability is so important. <clears throat> when you look at this slide here, you can see here, patients with positive margin resections, look at their median survival they're poor, right? Compared to those that undergo margin negative resection. So again, now, yes, one could argue that if you're having a positive margin resection, that the biology is worse, the tumors are more advanced. I agree. I don't disagree with that. But what do you do about it? So how do you classify this, right? So there's three buckets we look at, right? There's resectable, there's locally advanced, unresectable, and there's metastatic. We need to, for the, for the, for the purposes of this talk, remove the metastatic patient from this list because that's a whole separate sort of uh, discussion. So you have these two buckets, right? You have your resectable patients, your locally advanced patients, and this is the area where I think needs the most attention, right? It's this distinction of borderline resectable disease that drives a lot of the care in pancreatic cancer. So this is one of my favorite slides. Where do we draw the line in borderline resectable PDAC? What you see here is at least right now, four definitions, each of which are completely different in defining pancreatic cancer resectability. 
One of the tried and tested um, uh, definitions is the MD Anderson Group in 2006 uh, published these guidelines. And it was the real first solid attempt in defining this vague category of borderline resectable disease. And very simply, they combine them as resectable, borderline, and locally advanced. And you can see here the terminology. So superior mesenteric artery, we just saw that on the anatomy slide. Tumor abutment of less than 180 degrees is considered borderline resectable disease. Celiac or, or, or hepatic artery, short segment encasement, borderline resectable disease. For the SMV, short segment occlusion, borderline resectable disease. Another definition, and I want you to pay note of these specific words, impingement and narrowing, borderline resectable disease. NCCN guidelines, distortion or narrowing, borderline resectable disease, encasement, direct abutment. The common trend up until this point is that what's distortion to me may not be distortion to someone else. So you're inaccurately categorizing patients into borderline resectable disease because there's no consensus on how you stage these patients, right? So. To, 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 the, you know, to the NCCN kind of understanding this, this, this dilemma in 2018, they actually, for the first time, added some more you know, direct language. So what you see here in pancreatic cancer, you say borderline susceptible disease, solid tumor contact, less than 180 degrees of the SMA, right? So here for the first time, we see that they're applying more direct um, uh, numbers to kind of help clarify this. For the vein, you can see here, they're saying solid tumor contact of over 180 degrees borderline, less than 180 degrees with contour irregular. So there's still some you know, bias here that the operating surgeon can potentially um, use to say they think it's borderline versus not. And of note, they also finally included body and tail lesions because we see a lot of patients with tumors in the body and tail of the pancreas. And this is another definition, the alliance definition, which again, very similar to the NCCN guidelines, uh, mentioned specific uh, interfaces of vein involvement to help determine what the definition would be. Uh, again, 180 degrees of the vein, um, short segment of the artery, and the SMA of 180. You know, when you look at the resectability for pancreatic cancer, there's other criteria that need to sort of, you know, be circulated in your head. And one of them is, and this is what the MD Anderson group did, is they, they classify these into type A, B, and C. And type A is your typical sort of based on imaging, right? But what about nodal status, right? So what if you have a CT scan that shows lymph nodes? We know those patients are a little bit more high risk, right? And what about the patients that are just terrible operative candidates, right? These type C patients, are you gonna take them straight for a Whipple? You gotta be careful here. And I think this definition sort of adds another layer to what we need to sort of think about. And again, this is just a nice picture to kind of see what this means. So abutment is when the veins are just sort of kissing on the, uh, the tumors are just kissing on the veins. And then encasement obviously is when it's much more advanced. So almost 12 years ago, our group here at Fox Chase looked at this idea of defining venous involvement for this borderline resectable category. And this is a study we wrote here where we looked at what we call Ishikawa staging. And, and what Ishikawa staging is, it's, it's ways for us to look at the imaging and decide on the degree of vessel involvement on the imaging study to determine what's happening. So what we found here is that patients that received preoperative therapy lived longer, right? Um, but what was interesting is when you got preoperative chemo radiation, you got a higher R0 resection rate. So what that means is that with preoperative therapy, we're affecting those margin negative resections. And if you look at this uh, next slide here, you'll see um, the higher Ishikawa stage. Again, Ishikawa stage is two, three, four, and five. And the higher you go, the more vessel involvement on imaging that you see, the more chance you had of needing a vein resection. And when you look at survival, you'll see here for the Ishikawa on table A, one to three, the survival was much better than those with Ishikawa types four and five. So yes, half the game is sort of 
understanding the biology of the disease, but also understanding your limitations when it comes to um, operating on patients with significant vessel involvement. Now, 10 years later, um, when, I, when I got here, um, we looked at this exact same question and, and we asked ourselves, can we use preoperative vascular grading to help determine who's gonna have a positive margin? And this picture you see on the bottom really depicts nicely the Ishikawa staging. So normal, a smooth shift, a unilateral narrowing, bilateral narrowing, and bilateral narrowing with collateral veins. And you can see here in our study that Ishikawa was strongly associated with a positive SMA and SMB margin. And again, it makes sense, right? If you can predict on your imaging which one of these categories you fall into, the higher chance you have of having a positive margin. And this is what you know, this data from our, from our center showed. So I've spent the past 10 minutes or so talking about vascular staging, right? So is that the true staging for pancreatic cancer? Absolutely not. And this is where there's a lot of back and forth in the literature because the AJCC is our sort of benchmark cancer staging for all of our cancers, breast, colon, uh, head and neck cancers. And if you look at the um, AJCC staging, not anywhere does it mention the details of the vascular staging. By and large, you see here T3 without involvement of the celiac or SMA, T4 involves the celiac or the SMA. What about the vein? What about abutment? What about the, the degrees of abutment? So we should all be sitting here right now thinking what the heck is going on with this because we have a definition of vascular susceptibility that's so important for the surgeons and the oncologists to decide what therapy to give a patient, but there's no consensus in how these are defined. This leads us into sort of the, the, the heart of the talk here of neoadjuvant trials. This space is so important. This space is, is, is where, again, a lot of um, developing uh, data has been emerging um, to support the use of neoadjuvant therapy in, in pancreatic cancer. Because if you look at it, and, and, and again, this is a whole separate hour-long talk, the standard approach for a long time was adjuvant chemotherapy, right? Patients get surgery, and then they get adjuvant chemo. And when you look at the data, you know, a Whipple is not a trivial pursuit. This is a big operation. And it can be anywhere from 60% of people are too ill after a Whipple to get chemotherapy. So the rationale is, do we give the therapy up front so we maximize that potential? Now, <clears throat> I can't ask anyone on this call, but who this gentleman is. This is Blake Cady. He's an American surgical oncologist, and he was actually our society's president uh, in the late 80s. And he eloquently said this phrase, which I, I really hope everyone will understand and take, take to heart. Tumor biology is king, selection is queen, and technical maneuvers are the princes and princesses trying to usurp the throne, sometimes with temporary apparent victories and usually to no long-term avail, right? So this highlights the fact that tumor biology is king. Yes, I could do a whipple on anybody, but if the biology is not behaving well, is it worthwhile to put that patient through that kind of an operation? And that's a big debate in the, in the surgical literature and the surgical world. So what is the point of neoadjuvant therapy? There's a couple of things that it does. It provides this time where we can gauge the aggressiveness of the disease, right? So a, a, an opportunity for us to sort of see the biology of the disease. Yes, we're selecting patients who have stable or responding disease. We treat early micrometastatic disease. We downstage to maximize the goal for an R0 resection. Again, <clears throat> from the beginning of my slides, you saw that our goal is to achieve a complete resection of the, of the, of the tumor with no residual disease left behind. Doug Evans, a mentor to many of, of, uh, of the contemporary surgeons, um, put together in the early 90s this really sort of novel approach to pancreatic cancer. And for the first time, he termed this potentially resectable disease, right? So we're starting now to understand this idea even back in the early 90s. And all these patients have pancreatic cancer, and their rationale was to give them chemoradiation for five and a half weeks and see what happened. 
And one of the first major myths was disproved. All of these patients completed their therapy. People said, well, why would I want to give somebody chemotherapy and radiation before surgery? They're not going to be fit enough to have surgery afterwards. Well, they were. And when you look at the toxicities, by and large, they were pretty acceptable in the general um, population uh, of patients in this cohort. And the one thing that it also added, this, this sort of um, landmark study, was it for the first time looked at a grading system for treatment effect. So what we know is that when you deliver preoperative therapy, the tumors will start dying. And what we found at our center is that when you have more tumor kill, the better the survival of the patients will be. And you can also see here, the margin negative resection was far superior in these patient cohorts. So this suggests that we can do these operations safely after chemoradiation, they can tolerate their therapy and all therapy can be given. Huge landmark here. This led to a couple of years later, this is my mentor, John Hoffman. Um, John Hoffman was a, a leader uh, in pancreatic cancer at this center at Fox Chase. And I took over his practice in, in 2012. Um, I still talk to Dr. Hoffman pretty much on a weekly basis, and um, he's still very much involved in a lot of my research um, and, and manuscript that I'll write. But he hypothesized in, in that time frame also, let's give her the, let's give the adjuvant therapy that we were giving after before and see what happens, right? And what was interesting is in, in, in Dr. Hoffman's sort of pilot fox chase study, what they found was that the median survival time survival from time of diagnosis uh, was 45 months. This was like a breakthrough here in the neoadjuvant space. And what this led to is probably one of the most important things in clinical trial research is a phase two cooperative group study. So because of Dr. Hoffman's pursuits in the, in the mid nineties, this led to a prospective multi-institutional randomized trial um, looking at, or sorry, clinical trial, phase two trial, looking at patients that were going to undergo preoperative chemo radiation. This all sounds great, right? You're going to see what the pitfalls were in one minute. So again, overall, toxicities were acceptable in this clinical trial. But when you look at the curves, something happened here. So the median overall survival was five, eight, and 15 months. So what the heck? I mean, how did this happen? How could you three years before have a trial which showed 45, 45 months survival and now all of a sudden go to this? Well, what was interesting in this study was that <clears throat> while we found it safe to give therapy, patients were entered in the study with far advanced tumors because there's no definition, right? We did a poor job in defining who had borderline resectable disease. And that was the goal of this study to treat those patients in the middle category. So this is why definitions are so important. And when you look at the studies in the early 90s, you'll see across the board here, median survival anywhere from nine months to 37 or to, to 23 months. And um, again, many of these sort of neoadjuvant therapy patients were included in resectables marginally resectable, locally advanced. And I think this really confounds the reports um, of these early clinical trials. So in 2013, when I was a fellow here, we wrote a letter to the editors. How do we define this disease, right? Where do we draw the line in borderline resectable disease? And it really sort of, at that point in time in the, in, in the mid 2000s, gained a lot of momentum and traction in this field. When you look at this slide, it's a busy slide, but what I wanna highlight here is, look how many definitions we're using to define resectability. NCCN 2008, NCCN 2005, 2010, the AHPBA definition, the MD Anderson definition. I mean, if there's no uniformity in definition, how can you possibly design a real clinical trial? And you can see here, a plethora of different sort of staging uh, based on the individual um, uh, resectability criteria that we used. So we had this epiphany, right? We had this idea as sort of, well, what do we do at this point, right? What chemotherapies are good in the neoadjuvant setting? How do you define the disease, et cetera? You know, as with a lot of cancers, we extrapolate data. 
right? So this is probably a landmark protege trial that looked at metastatic pancreatic cancer patients, right? So we said in this group, you see here, median overall survival was 11 months in the Fulfirinox group compared to six months in the GEM group. And you see clear separation of the curves on the table to the right. So we thought, all right, well, if it works in the metastatic world, can we deliver this neoadjuvant therapy in the, you know, in the surgical world or the non-metastatic world? And this led to one of the pivotal sort of clinical trials in pancreatic cancer in the neoadjuvant space. And again, it was a very simple design. Fulfirinox, radiation, surgery, chemo, follow, right? And what they found in this early pilot study was, was novel stuff enhanced R0 resection rates, enhanced tumor kill. And what this did is this led to one of the, in my opinion, one of the pivotal trials in pancreatic cancer. And Fox Chase enrolled several patients in this clinical trial. And again, the trial design was pretty much randomizing patients to ARM1 and ARM2, where you had Fulfirinox, more chemo, and then surgery or radiation. Because one of the biggest sort of confusing areas in pancreatic cancer was, is there a role for radiation, right? We know this disease is systemic at the onset by and large. So does radiation really kind of help make the decisions of what to do? While this was an important study design, the schema is important, what this trial also did was this. It took three definitions, moved them to the side, and they made their own definitions. So this trial had very, very strict criteria um, using specific degree of vessel involvement to determine what a patient was resectable or borderline resectable. So they really understood this idea of defining the disease before you enrolled on clinical trials. And uh, this was about 126, 126 patients, <clears throat> started in 2016 and uh, completed in 2020. And the results were recently released just last year uh, uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And again, just to refresh, arm A was chemo only, arm B was chemo radiation. All patients received additional chemotherapy afterwards. What's really interesting here, and there's so much debate in, in med Twitter uh, on this specific topic, um, are, you know, the arm A, 93% 18 month overall survival versus 78% in arm B, median, a uh, follow-up was 27, 31 months, and the overall survival was found to be poor in the RMB. And this caused a storm of controversy. It's sort of why, why all of a sudden now are we saying that radiation is actually harmful to patients? Well, there's a lot of sort of, again, debate in, in this sort of um, um, question. And, you know, one of the biggest sort of thing that they talked about was the radiation that was delivered in this uh, clinical trial was using stereotactic radiation as opposed to traditional external beam radiation, and maybe that played a role. Nonetheless, the overall sort of consensus from this clinical trial was that chemotherapy resulted in favorable overall survival. Now, hypofraction of radiation did not improve survival, and this has now led to a whole sort of, um, you know, separate... Um, um, talkings of, of, of additional clinical trials to investigate this. So we wrote this paper here, myself and Dr. Hoffman in 2016, where we argued, what about for resectable pancreatic cancer, right? What about for tumors that we know are resectable? Forget about borderline and locally advanced, <clears throat> but is there an argument or a disadvantage to giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy in resectable patients? Big debate, right? This is just like, you know, how do you sort of define, how do you justify giving somebody with a tumor that can come out chemotherapy or radiation up front? Well, in 2020, um, Dr. Saeed, um, sorry, Saeed Ahmad at uh, Cincinnati asked this exact question. And this was the SWOG 1505 study that we also participated in. And it was a very simple design. They looked at the two backbone regimens in pancreatic cancer, Fulfirinox and gemcitabine, and they just went head to head. And the results were actually quite interesting. The median overall survival was 22 and 23 months. There was no statistical significance. And when you look at the arms here, they were very well matched between the both um, Fulfirinox and the gemcitabine arm. So would we say this is a failure of a clinical trial? Absolutely not. Because what it showed is 
two-year overall survival, 41% with Fulfirinox and 48% with gemcitabine. While there was no difference between the two arms, we've showed staggering survival benefits with neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the resectable space. So that is what the take home is here. And what you can also say is that technically in the neoadjuvant setting, both regimens sort of work, work pretty well. This led to, again, a very recent sort of uh, publication called the Preopank trial. And this was a phase three trial that looked at randomly assigning patients to a neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy or upfront surgery. So this is an interesting trial because again, um, this included resectable and borderline resectable patients. And one could argue upfront surgery and borderline resectable is not necessarily the best option, but again, it's still the standard of care um, in many cases. And what they found here is, um, I'll show you here, those that underwent and what's interesting here is if you had neoadjuvant chemo radio, uh, chemo radiotherapy, 61% underwent resection. So I asked people, and you can't respond, but that means 40% of people did not. That means 40% of people would have went to surgery and they would have either closed, been unable to resect the tumor, and that would have been, uh, in my opinion, a failure. So we saved this many people from undergoing a surgery that may not have been particularly helpful. And what you also see here, as opposed to upfront surgery, is if you got the preoperative therapy, your margin resection negative rate was 72% as opposed to 43%. And the real kicker, 20% versus 6.5% survival. So Preopank really showed us, and this is long-term results, that the use of new adjuvant therapy is substantially better than those in the upfront surgery group. Now, this is going to be um, data that's coming out soon, the Preopank 2 study, um, which looks to randomize patients to neoadjuvant fulfirinox, which again was arm A in the Alliance trial, um, followed by surgery without adjuvant treatment versus kind of a chemo radiation arm. So this is another sort of trial trying to compare and see, you can see the schema here um, of, 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 what's, of what's sort of happening and going on. Um, so we should feel pretty good about ourselves, right? We, we, we've talked about sort of new adjuvant trials, um, um, understanding kind of what the rationale is. And now I'm gonna kind of just focus the talk and kind of twist the talk a little bit on some of our own data. Because to really understand this, you have to sort of look deep into your own sort of institutional practices and understand what's going on. So this is gonna be some Fox Chase Cancer Center data, which I'll go over uh, now. So I like this slide because it shows kind of Fox Chase beating up pancreatic cancer. Um, and, you know, we've had a long story tradition here at the center, again, really culminating from the efforts of Dr. Hoffman on the use of new adjuvant therapy for pancreatic cancer. Um, and again, um, we're going to go over some of our own data. So this is recently published data that we just published, I think, uh, this year, where we looked at our own total neoadjuvant therapy experience. So total neoadjuvant therapy is the, the ability to deliver chemotherapy, radiation, and then ultimately surgery. And you can see here through the stages, you stage chemotherapy, stage radiation, stage surgery. You see the word staging multiple times in the slide because it is so important to not take somebody to surgery if they have disease that is either you know, micro or, or, or metastatic at the time of the surgery. And this was sort of our schema here. And you can see we have surgery first, and then we have the TNT group. And then there's this interesting group that we call SMNT, single modality neoadjuvant therapy. Those are patients that either are getting chemo radiation or chemo alone. And that cohort of patients was studied in our, in our, um, in our cohort. And this is sort of a busy slide, but by and large, the, the bottom line is <clears throat> there's no significant, uh, you can see just the basic demographics here. Here, you'll see the NCCN resectability classification. You, you'll see here that the majority of patients, 71% um, to be specific, um, had borderline resectable disease in the TNT group. When we looked at CA, um, clinical stage, you'll also see that the higher clinical stage, those patients were getting randomized, or not randomized, but placed in the TNT group. So yes, there's 100% selection bias here, but
but this just shows just some 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 data. Um, when we looked at CA199, interestingly enough, there was no significance. And what we know, a lot of studies out there are saying that response to CA199 actually has shown um, a significant sort of effect. Um, but unfortunately, our data didn't sort of corroborate that. When you look at sort of specific regimens here, and what's interesting to note on this slide is that who received adjuvant chemo? So what you see here, and again, in the surgery first group, 70% received adjuvant chemo. That goes in line with the literature, right? 30% then didn't. So that's a lot. That's a lot of people that for whatever complication may have occurred, et cetera, they were too weak, et cetera, they could not get their adjuvant therapy. So again, that does sort of carry some weight here. When you look at those that we've downstaged, in those that got chemo or the total new adjuvant therapy, 65% of patients in our cohort got downstaged. And the real sort of um, highlight here is R0 resection, 70 or 86% R0 resection rate in our cohort um, that received uh, total new adjuvant therapy. And when you look at the survival curves, I mean, this says it all, right? The TNT survival curves clearly separate from that of the surgery first and the single modality therapy. When you look at, because we were just curious, if you got adjuvant therapy in the surgery first group, yes, you did better. But again, 70% got adjuvant therapy, 30% did not. And that, that is not a trivial number. When you look at, does it benefit patients to get adjuvant therapy after total new adjuvant therapy? And in our cohort, it didn't. So we gave the, the lion's share of the chemo up front. And when you didn't get adjuvant chemotherapy, what we found in our TNT group is that there was significance in terms of survival. So one thing that we really sort of, I'd like to highlight here is we talked about that fibrosis and our center really sort of was a pioneer also looking at a fibrosis. And you can see here in the total new adjuvant therapy group, 80% had um, um, uh, fibrosis versus that of 70% of the single group. This idea of a complete pathologic response, we had a 10% complete path response. So what does that mean? That means that in 10% of our cohort, there was no visible tumor left. So when you look at that and how that translates into numbers, median survival from diagnosis in our cohort was 42 months. Median survival from operation, the TNT group was 33 months. Median survival, if you had a path CR, 100.2 months. That's staggering in pancreas cancer. Um, and I think this just shows you that how do you achieve a path CR, right? You got to give therapy up front. That's the only way you're going to achieve a path CR. Now, our group also looked at, and uh, this was my fellow, Dr. Barak, we published um, an NCDB sort of analysis looking at this exact question. And what we found is that if you achieved a path CR, you had significant overall survival benefit as compared to those who did not. So again, we reaffirmed that idea. So this leads to the big question is radiation versus no radiation again, right? We had talked about this in, in, in a few slides before and our group in 2021 or 2022 published this data that looked to evaluate the significance. And this is a very simple question we asked all right, if you have a positive surgical margin and you got chemo rads versus if you had upfront surgery and you had a positive margin, what happened, right? So pretty much what we found is that if you had a positive margin after new adjuvant chemo radiation, you have longer survival with patients with a positive margin from upfront surgery. So are we cheating a little bit? Perhaps. Um, but if you get the new adjuvant chemo RADS, even if you had a positive margin, you're still sterilizing it in some capacity, and it, and it, and it showed um, a positive benefit in this cohort. So we've now outlined this sort of series of time, right, from the early 90s when we adopted new adjuvant therapy to present time. And I want to just spend the last sort of few slides going over some actual sort of effects that we see with neoadjuvant therapy. So here you see the tumor uh, in the arrow in red. And here you see the uh, superior mesenteric vein. 
And here you see the superior mesenteric artery. And you can see on this slide, this haziness here, right? There's tumor involving the vein and abutting the artery. This patient got total new adjuvant therapy. And you can see here now, tumor, that hypodense area is resolved. The vein interface is open and the artery is now completely clear. So we've taken this patient to surgery, rendered them an R0 resection. This patient you can see here has a tumor now in the neck slash body of the pancreas. And you, can, and you can sort of subtly see this vein is being impinged here and kind of narrowed in some capacity. Following treatment, you can see here <coughs> the tumor shrunk and the vein opened up. Another one, this is a body tumor. And you can see here the um, splenic artery is completely encased very close to the confluence um, of the celiac axis. And following therapy, it shrunk. And you can see the interface between the uh, vein and the, uh, the artery here is a little bit better. This is a great picture showing an Ishikawa um, four, right? Where we have bilateral uh, vein um, narrowing here by tumor. And following therapy, you can see how beautifully that sort of interface opened up. Lastly, this is a gentleman that actually has a genetic mutation, a PALB2 mutation. And you can see here, very, very bulky tumor. This is all his tumor over here, abutting the vein, abutting the artery, actually coming behind the artery over here. This gentleman received preoperative chemo radiation and chemotherapy. And you can see here the response he rendered. He's now, I think, a four-year pancreatic cancer survivor. So we really kind of covered a lot of ground here in terms of the, the role for chemotherapy and neoadjuvant therapy. And I really asked the audience sort of what conclusions can we draw with everything that I talked about today? And this is really an open-ended question. You will see hundreds and hundreds of studies on PubMed about chemotherapy, not doing chemotherapy? Do we do surgery first? Do we not do surgery first? And, you know, I'm not here to sort of convince anybody that we're, you know, at a, at a, at a pivotal breakthrough point, although some would argue. Um, but I'd like to impart to the audience that it's not about the amount of clinical trials. It's about sort of well-designed clinical trials in the space. And the key with this cancer, as, as other cancers, is to have uniformity among specialists before we can make decisions. And we have to make better standardized clinical trials and we need more work in this space to sort of really move this needle forward. Um, this is my, my team at Fox Chase that I work with. This is uh, Igor Aseterov to the left and Eddie Kukerman to the, in the middle. Uh, Igor uh, does a lot of work uh, with PDX models and mice models. In fact, we have a pretty good PDX program here where we implant the majority of our pancreatic tumors into uh, mice. And uh, we, we grow them and we, we, we experiment with them. And Eddie Kukerman um, has a lab that looks at the microenvironment. She's a thought leader in the field of fibrosis and stroma modulation. Um, I can do a whole other talk on the lab side of, uh, of, of our research here. Um, but that.